tonight. Well, would you turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me pray. Our generous and grateful, gracious, loving God, we come to you in the only name by which we can approach you, by which our righteousness is found. That name is of the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot come on our own merit. We cannot come because we have done good, because we have not. We come because great good was done to us. We come because Christ died for us. Grace was poured out upon us, undeserving, ill-deserving sinners. And you have washed us clean, made us righteous in your sight through faith and through the work of your Spirit, causing our eyes to be open to the glorious greatness and beauty and kindness and compassion of our Savior. We give you thanks. We come into your presence with thanksgiving. We are humble before you that, that you would be so kind to us. And we want you to be exalted, the giver of all good things, the rewarder of those who seek you. So would you use this morning to prepare our hearts to praise and worship you to whom all glory is due. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You know, in, in, you're in 2 Corinthians 4, stay there, but in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul lets us know, the Apostle Paul, that, that the last days before Christ returns will be difficult ones because people will, will be consumed with themselves. They will, they will be unbridled in their pursuit of sin. He says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. Paul goes on. The list keeps going. But did you catch that last description of what men will become when they, when they cast aside the last vestiges of Christianity and live to satisfy themselves? Amongst many other sinful vices, man becomes ungrateful. And when a person is ungrateful, we see from this pathetic description of sinful man that they will also be prideful, abusive, and insubordinate. And in the last days, there is no place for humility in the heart of men. And because humility has been forsaken, gratitude is cast off as well. Gratitude grows out of humility. Grateful people do not, exceed, do not seek to exalt themselves. They seek to exalt others. A thankful heart is rooted in a strong belief in God as the sovereign creator, sustainer, and giver from whom all good things ultimately come. And when in pride men refuse to believe themselves indebted to God for all that they have and hope to have, there is no longer a source of gratitude in their hearts. The gratitude and glory that rightly belongs to God is discarded and replaced with a love for self and that of exalting ourselves. For all people by nature love their own glory more than the glory of God. However, when gratitude springs up in the human heart toward God, 
The Lord is magnified as the generous and abundant source of all our blessings. He is acknowledged as the generous giver and provider and therefore as glorious. Our Thanksgiving holiday in America, it goes all the way back to our beginning as a nation. It goes back to our first president, George Washington, who issued a proclamation saying this, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the benef beneficent author of all the good that was that is, or that will be. This holiday is indeed a time to enjoy family, friends, good food, but let it also be specifically a time to set aside an expression of God-glorifying gratitude. It's the title of my message this morning, God-glorifying gratitude. Our text is verse 15 in chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians. Paul says there, For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. So from this text, my hope is that you will first understand what gratitude is. It's, it is joy, not just for grace received, but joy towards the giver. That you'll appreciate what gratitude does. It conveys humility for something undeserved and encouragement for the one who gave. And then lastly, you'll remember what gratitude is for. Paul says our joy and gratitude should ultimately glorify God. So the heart of man is increasingly matching Paul's description of the last days. But you, Christian, you are to shine as light amidst darkness. And one of the ways that you can do that, both at this time of year, as well as every other day, is to remember God's Word to you this morning. And let your gratitude for God's grace abound to His glory. Let your gratitude for God's grace abound to His glory. I'm grateful for the insights of, of John Piper on gratitude. They helped me in preparing this message for you this morning. And Because we're parachuting into the middle of Paul's letter, let's take a moment to understand the context of Paul's statement down in verse 15. So coming into chapter 4 here, Paul is talking to the Corinthians about his own ministry, what it's like. The ministry he, he has is it's not a product of his own merit or initiative, but it's a result, uh, he says, of God's mercy. His ministry has nothing sh to, uh, shameful to hide, nor does it tamper with the Word of God, verse 2 says, but it's open, it's truthful in the sight of God. Paul's ministry, he says in verse 5, he says it's not focused on man. It's focused on the Lord Jesus Christ and his role is to serve the churches for Jesus' sake. While there are people who are blind to the glory of Christ, verse 4, by God's grace, the light of the gospel can break through this blindness, cause their hearts to see, verse 6. Paul's role is to simply minister the gospel of Christ through which God's power will be displayed. Paul is simply, he says, a clay pot. But he's a clay pot that that contains the glorious treasure of the gospel and the life of Christ. God is the one who gets all the glory for any successes in his ministry. In fact, in verses 8 and 9, Paul says that he is often faced with troubles in ministry. He's faced with affliction, with confusion, with persecution, with failures. That doesn't sound like ministry. Doesn't ministry always go well? 
No, he says, this, this happens all the time. But through it all, Paul says he's, he is sustained by God. And the reason for all this trouble and the suffering is not because Paul's a poor minister. No, God has a plan for all this. He says in verses 11 and 12, it's through all these hardships of ministry that the life of Christ will shine more clearly. That's why you need to be praying for your pastors. Because whatever hardships God allows are meant to display the power and life of God. And you need to be, you need to be praying that that's what happens through the hardships that we face. Paul's willingness to endure so much. Even, even here he says, die for Christ. It serves as evidence of the life of Christ in him. And through his suffering on their behalf, Paul hopes to show the churches the power of Christ's life in which he hopes. So Paul tells us that his willingness to share in the death of Christ, it arises out of his faith. What he believes, what he knows is true. He knows that if God raised Jesus from the dead, He can raise Him also. He will raise Him also. And not only Him, but all who have come to know Christ through Paul's ministry. It's for them, Paul says now in verse 15, it's for them that He does what He does as an apostle. For all things are for your sakes so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Notice that his ministry, though, it does not end with men. It does not end with men, not even converted, redeemed men. Not even thankful men does it end there. Yes, he serves for men's sake, but above and beyond that, in a far greater importance, the goal of all that Paul does, he says in verse 15, is the glory of God. Paul wants all eyes to be not on him, not on his sacrifices, but on God's glorious grace. And in verse 15, Paul shows the important role that gratitude plays in his ministry and in ours too. He says he wants his ministry to cause people to be thankful. Right? So, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to understand what gratitude is. Paul says his hope is that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to God. Paul says that grace from God toward men is causing gratitude in men. Now the ESV, if you have that, it says thanksgiving. The New American Standard, it translates the Greek word there, giving of thanks. That's the same word, thanksgiving, giving of thanks, right? Both of which are they're fine translations. They just mean gratitude. But what's interesting, though, is that the Greek word for giving of thanks, for thanksgiving here, it's derived from the Greek word for grace. Grace is teres. The Greek for, for giving of thanks is eucharistia. Charis in the middle of it. Gratitude, therefore, it has a close connection to grace. In fact, understanding this relationship between grace and gratitude is key to understanding what gratitude is. So how do we understand gratitude from the standpoint of our experience? You know, we train our children to say thank you when they have been given something, right? Even when they don't mean it. We want them to say thank you. And we do this, why? Because it's polite. It's polite to say thank you when you have been given something. And so your son might say thank you for the gift of socks that he gets at Christmas, 
But that doesn't mean he's thankful for the socks. So this shows us that gratitude is something beyond just the willpower that it takes to muster the words, thank you. That's not gratitude. It's more than that. If there is no feeling of gratitude behind the words, thank you, you are not grateful. You're certainly being polite, but you're not really grateful for what's been given to you. See, real gratitude is accompanied by the feeling of gratitude. In fact, if you think about it, that's what gratitude is. It is a spontaneous feeling that naturally it just arises in your heart. Right? It's not coerced. It cannot be willed into existence if it's not there on its own. And so when you replace the Christmas gift of socks with the new iPhone 10, the gratitude will show up all on its own. It'll just be there. It, it's a feeling. It's a good feeling. And it spontaneously arises within our hearts. It's a delightful, it's a joyful feeling that comes about freely and uncoerced. We can put it this way. Gratitude is joy for the receiving of grace. Gratitude is joy for the receiving of grace. But gratitude is more than just delighting in a gift or receiving something that you wanted. Right? Because it's possible that when your son receives that new iPhone 10, that they're excited about their new device, that they're absorbed with it, and they tell all their friends about it, but he never gives a thought to the kindness and the generosity and the sacrifice that you showed in buying them that new $1,000 iPhone 10. possible to be so consumed with the gift that you think nothing of the one who gave it to you. So to be excited for the gift, but not grateful to the giver is not gratitude. It's not gratitude because his joy is not directed to you, the one who gave the gift. So gratitude is more than joy for receiving of grace. It is also joy towards the giver of grace. Gratitude is a feeling of happiness that is directed toward a person for giving you something good. Gratitude is joy for the receiving of grace and toward the giver of grace. Now remember also that Gratitude is linked to grace. We saw that initially, right? Grace. What is grace? It's undeserved favor. Grace is not earned. It's not earned like a paycheck, right? You, you receive a paycheck for, work, for the work that you do. It is, it is an exchange of your work for money. So, you may be thankful to have a job, I'm sure you are, but, but your paycheck is not an example of grace. Right? You agreed to work for a certain compensation. And when the work is performed, you are owed that money. They have not done you a favor in paying you. They are giving you something that you earned. But with gratitude, right, your joy is linked to getting something you did not earn. In fact, the more undeserved the gift, the greater the feeling of gratitude. So what is gratitude? Gratitude is joy for the receiving of grace and towards the giver of grace. And the greater the grace received, the greater the gratitude you feel. Now, we need to appreciate what gratitude does. 
Think about all the situations in which you say thank you to someone. When you go to the grocery store and you pay for your groceries, what do you say when they hand you the receipt? Thank you. When you have your car fixed, don't you say thank you? Right? But why do you say thank you? You paid them. You paid them for what they did. You paid for the groceries. Why do you thank the checker? You paid for the, the repair. Why do you thank the mechanic? Nobody did you a favor. So why do we thank people who have done their job? Why do we thank people who have done what you paid them to do? It's because gratitude is linked to grace. And expressions of gratitude, like thank you, they become more than just expressions of gratitude. They become expressions of humility, means of encouragement. First, gratitude conveys humility for a need met. To thank someone who is just doing their job, what are you doing? You are humbling yourself as someone who has a need that they have met. So when our family goes out to eat, that's a pretty big ordeal, right? The poor waitress who has to bring us all our drinks, has to refill all those drinks a few times, has to bring us more bread, and more bread, and more bread, and all our meals, and then clear all those plates, we thank her. But I'm going to pay her. I'm going to pay the bill. And then what I'm going to do on top of that? I'm going to tip her. So why say thank you? It's because saying thank you to her is saying, you know, you may be serving me, but I don't want you to think that I'm better than you. I, I want you to know that I am grateful for the work that you did to meet my need and my family's need here at this restaurant. Thank you. You know, if you've ever worked in customer service, you know that the hardest people to serve are those people who make you think they're better than you and that your purpose here is to serve me. Right? I worked at Starbucks in between software and ministry. Starbucks. Got a little dose of customer service. You know, if you give someone their coffee and they hand you money and then walk out, you know what you say? What an arrogant jerk. Right? You give them coffee, they give you money, and they say nothing to you. Who does he think he is? Think he's better than me? But has he done anything wrong? No. No, he paid for his coffee. But in withholding gratitude, he comes across as arrogant, and you get offended. Now that may not be in every culture in the world, but that's the culture here in America. When you withhold gratitude, you seem arrogant. And this is because an expression of gratitude does something. It conveys an appropriate humility as one whose need has been met. It does this because of the close connection between grace and gratitude. Now, it's not just humility that we want to convey, if you think about it. Right? We also want to convey encouragement. Gratitude conveys encouragement to the one who met the need. So take the waitress. You know, this is the way I think. I don't know if it's the way you think. I, I, more than likely it is. Right? When, when we leave there and I look back at that table and the big mess of plates and napkins and dirty dishes and all that kind of stuff, I will look for the waitress or the waiter who served us so that I can look at them and I can say, thank you. Thank you for meeting our need while we were here. I'll say something like, you did a great job with us. Thanks a lot. Oh, my pleasure. No. I want them to know they did a good job, even if they didn't do the best job. I want them to know I'm grateful. 
Not just that they met my need, but they did a good job in meeting my need. And that's what gratitude does because it's closely related to grace. It conveys humility for a need met, and it conveys encouragement to the one who met the need. And so with this understanding of gratitude, let's go back now to our text in 2 Corinthians 4. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. So Paul says that all that he does in his ministry is for their sake. So that as grace extends to more and more people, it will cause gratitude to abound more and more to the glory of God. And this is because as grace is given, the joy of that undeserved kindness is expressed as gratitude towards the giver of grace. And so this is Paul's ministry. Paul's ministry is is to spread grace. And it's spread through his ministry, which verse 5 tells us how he spreads it. He spreads it by preaching Christ. He preaches Christ Jesus as Lord. And in doing that, the grace of God is spread to more and more people. So it's the grace of Christ that's being spread to more and more people through the preaching of the gospel. Paul puts it this way in chapter 8. In verse 9 he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, so that through His poverty you might become rich. See, this this verse, it very clearly pictures what grace is. It is. It is the one with the riches giving it to those who are poor so that they might become rich. We're poor. We're poor and we're empty. But we are filled by the riches and the fullness of Christ. That's grace. Jesus makes us rich, not because we deserve to be rich, but because He is gracious. Because He gave so freely and so fully when we were hopeless and destitute, And deserving of condemnation, such grace causes gratitude to well up in our hearts. He doesn't that cause you to think when you're here and the people around you are singing and you're thinking about what you want to do after church? Thinking about what food you want to eat and thinking about the game you want to watch or how you want to relax. And everyone else is around singing, Show us Christ! God, reveal your glory. And you're thinking something else. You don't understand grace. You may not even be a recipient of grace. You're just in church. Grace and gratitude are linked. If grace has been poured out in your heart, there is gratitude overflowing. And it's coming out. doesn't matter if you can hit the notes or not. You sing. Try to keep me from singing. You can't. It's got to be expressed. God made song and music for this purpose so that you can express your gratitude to God in a manner that fulfills you. That says, yes! These words express my heart. The melody is pleasing It combines with the emotion of what I feel inside and I can express it fully to you. It's not all there is. You've got to live it too. You know, if the opposite happens and you've got that worship face on and you've got your hands in the air and all that stuff and yet you go out and you indulge in sin and you live as if there is no God, that's that's nothing too. You haven't received grace because grace transforms too. But that's a different sermon. You've been made rich when you were destitute. And it's not because you got your MBA. It's not because you're smart. It's it's not because you know how to run a business or you're an entrepreneur, spiritually speaking. You were destitute. You were bankrupt. You did it all yourself. You ruined yourself. And 
God poured out His grace. The grace of Christ lavished upon you. The riches, the fullness of Christ just given to you because you put your faith in His Son. We're not just grateful for the abundance of grace received. We're not just glad that we're free from condemnation because that's not gratitude. Just because you've been given the gift of salvation, of eternal life, of righteousness, it's not gratitude unless it's towards the giver. We pour out our hearts in praise to Christ, the giver of grace, the giver of these riches, the riches of His salvation. And when this grace penetrates your heart, it echoes back to God in that happiness that you feel toward Jesus. And so we understand what gratitude is. It's joy for the receiving of grace and it's joy towards the giver of grace. And when we appreciate what gratitude does in that it conveys humility for a need, it conveys encouragement to the one who met the need, all of this becomes gratitude, and we see how closely connected it is to grace. And we need to take this understanding so that it will impact our lives and our ministry. We need to remember what gratitude is for. Remember what gratitude is for. Gratitude is for giving joy and giving glory to God. And we see this in two other observations from what Paul said. First, Paul says all that he does in his ministry, the affliction, the con- all that he endures in his ministry, right? The affliction, the confusion, the persecution, the threats of death, they are for their sakes because it results in the spreading of the grace of Christ. For all things are for your sakes so that the spreading of grace, the, uh, the grace which is spreading to more and more people, right? So, but he also says that the purpose for which he spreads this grace is for God's sake, right? The grace which is spreading to more and more people that it may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. And so this ministry of grace is both for your sake and for God's sake. So let's look at what this means for us and how these two fit together. First, Paul endures everything in the ministry of God's grace for the sake of those in the church. He says says in another letter, 2 Timothy, Chapter 2, verse 10, he says, For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. So Paul, it was just Paul. It was the effect that Paul, that Christ had upon Paul when he called him out of his darkness and in his rebellion and hatred, and he put upon him the gift and the responsibility of apostleship to be a messenger of God, the result was that he endured much for the sake of others. There was nothing that he wouldn't do in the name of spreading the grace of God to more people. He lived to do God's people good. And the good that he desired was, according to this verse, it was to make them thankful And so the good that he desired to do and the goal of his ministry was it was to produce gratitude for Christ in the hearts of people. And since gratitude flows from grace, grace that's been given, his ministry therefore was to spread grace. And the more grace is spread, the more gratitude people felt in their hearts and the more glory God would get. Now remember the gratitude, what it is, it's it's delight. It's a joyful feeling that arises in our hearts as a response to grace. So Paul is aiming to delight God's people by telling them of the grace of Christ. So he is 
He is living to spread that which gives joy to God's people. So all that he does is for their sake, right? You can see this. So understanding this helps us in two ways. First, it should be our goal as well to give joy by giving grace. Ministry is not just, not just meeting some need in the church. Paul was willing to suffer hardships so that people might understand the grace that was for them in Christ Jesus. He endured it because it would result in their joy. What are we willing to endure so that those we minister grace to might gain joy? What is your goal when you serve other people? Paul is telling us that our goal needs when we serve others must be their joy, not just meeting some need. There's a difference. There's a difference between just meeting a need and making it my goal to give you joy. And that difference is reflected in what you will endure. Paul tells you that your goal needs to be giving joy. In other words, joy is joy your goal when you serve. See, when the other person's joy is your goal, you will gladly be inconvenienced in ministering to them. And to do this, you have to overcome your love of self and consider their needs as more important. I have one example of this that always stands out to me. There's probably others, but this one just stands out so large sometimes that I share it. And so many of you over the years have heard it a time or two, but it's worth repeating. When we were moving here, this is a simple expression where joy is the goal and not just meeting a need. When we were moving here and we had our house to pack up and all that, that stuff, a friend of ours came and, and did not say, is there anything I can do? Call me if you need me. No, her words were, would you please let me have your children so that you can pack? See what a difference that is? She, her goal was our joy. She didn't make it an inconvenience at all, though it may have been very inconvenient for her. We don't know. This friend made it our joy, her goal, our joy. Would you please let me have your children so that you can focus on moving? And it's these blessings of this sort that, that we need to be giving to each other. Can I, we're not saying this, but this is what we're saying. Can I please be inconvenienced? so that you can have joy? Can you say that? You can only say that if you set aside yourself and you consider others as more important. And that's what Paul is saying on the grand scale. I endure all this for your sake so that you might have joy and that that joy might echo back to God in praise. So give joy by giving grace. You know, there's many in the church today whose understanding of the gospel, it leads them to, to really just stop right here. To stop at, at this understanding that, that God's grace is given for man's sake. And Paul, as the minister of the gospel, he does what he does, right? He says it. I did it for your sakes. And we can stop there if we're not careful. It would seem that God shows grace to men. Paul preaches about the grace of Christ so that men can know freedom from sin's bondage, joy and gratitude that it produces. And to stop there is why so many in, under the banner of evangelical Christianity today have such a shallow and anemic understanding of the gospel. They see the end point of all that God does 
is to give joy to men. The end point of ministry is man. They don't say it that way, but that's the sum of all that they're saying and all that they're preaching. Now this, of course, includes the redemption of man, but man's good is the goal, not God's. And this is a tragedy. The end goal of our preaching is that Christ Jesus is Lord. And when God shines His light in our hearts, it is the glory of God in the, in the face of Christ that we see. And if you haven't seen that, you're not saved. If you haven't seen that Christ is glorious, that He is Lord, you're not saved. He didn't come here just to save you. God Himself declares that He passionately pursues His own glory in all that He does, and that includes in bringing salvation. He says in Isaiah 48, 11, He says, For my own sake, for my own sake I will act. For how can my name be profaned and my glory I will not give to another? See, the tragic thing is, is to see Christian preachers and congregations that put man at the center of all that God does. That is not the case for the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he says in Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. He said to the Ephesians, To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. To the Philippians, Now to our God and Father be the glory of God forever and ever. To Timothy he wrote, Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. See, all that Paul thought, all that Paul did, all that he endured, all of life, all of history, all of creation, finds its beginning and middle and end in God Himself. And Paul says it yet another way in our text. The grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. That's why He worked in your life. That's why grace was poured out upon you. That's why the Gospel is preached. So that God may get glory. And you might get saved. But as that grace is poured out, it resounds to the glory of God. And that's why I can say, if you have no song in your heart to sing, if you find other things to do besides singing the glories of God that are produced by the gratitude in your heart, if that's not there, you're not saved. You're playing games. You're playing church. And you can keep it up until God brings you down. And I pray that He brings you down. I pray that He flattens you on your back. And you see how hopeless you are to save yourself. And how much you need Christ. I pray He humbles you to the dust. So that you cry out to Him finally in desperation. Please save me, the wretch that I am. I have toyed with your grace. I have heard your gospel of grace over and over again. And yet I live my own way. I pursue my own things. I do nothing for your glory. I do it all for my glory. Forgive me. Please save me. Take this final application home with you this week as you sit down with your family and as you reflect on the goodness of God in your life. Final application is give glory to God for His grace. See, gratitude is joy toward God for His grace. And as we saw, the nature of gratitude is that it glorifies the giver. It acknowledges its own need 
and the kindness and the generosity of the giver. And just as I gladly humble myself and praise the waitress who serves my family in the restaurant by saying thank you to her, so I humble myself and I praise God when I feel gratitude to Him. And the difference is vast, of course, because my debt to God is beyond measure. The grace shown to me is without parallel. Everything that He does for me, He does freely. God owes me nothing. He owes you nothing. I was lost. I was lost in the wilderness of sin. I should have been left there to wander until I perished. I wasn't even looking for Him. And yet He sought me out. He found me. I was thirsty. I had no money to buy food or drink. I was hungry. And yet Christ in all His infinite fullness, He just freely gave what He had. He satisfied me. By His grace, He made me glad. And it is my gladness, my delight over such undeserved kindness, my gratitude by which the giver is glorified. Let God be glorified in our gratitude. Yes, Paul's goal for all that he does is the gladness of God's people, but, but he has an even greater goal for the joy that his ministry brings to sinners. His goal is the glory of God. The natural and joyful response of God's people to the grace He has shown them is gratitude. It doesn't have to be coerced. It does not have to be manipulated. We don't set the lights. We don't light the candles. We don't play the emotional music to manipulate you. We preach Christ Jesus as Lord, and the Holy Spirit does the rest. He shines the light on Christ in all His glory, and you say, yes, and amen, and thank you. Thank you. And if that's not there, your faith is worthless. Your faith is fake. It will not support you when you stand before God. The one who has received grace when he deserves condemnation can't help but feel joy and respond in grateful praise to the giver of grace. And so we are made glad and God is given glory and we say, Amen. And so in these dark days, these difficult times, let us shine the light of humility and joy and gratitude and glory to God. Let your gratitude for God's grace abound to His glory. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we take a moment to examine ourselves. Is there gratitude in our hearts? Do we understand how lost and hopeless and destitute that we were? Have we received you as Lord? Have we understood how desperate we were and our situation was? fall into the hands of the living God is a terrible thing unless you have sought refuge in Christ. And if you have, if you're there in, in the strong tower of Christ, if you've found a refuge in the storm in Christ, then you are grateful. And you can't, no one can stop you from being grateful or expressing your gratitude to Christ who hid you in Him. Oh, let, let Christ be honored in our hearts and in our lives by the gratitude we feel for what He has done. May it divert us from sin. 
and direct us to give you praise and to speak of you, to spread more grace so that it would cause the giving of thanks which would abound to the glory of God. Let us seek give joy in our ministering to one another and give glory to you, God, the giver of all grace. Be at work in our hearts. Show us if there's no gratitude there because grace has not really been received. It's not even understood. Show us where we have thought ourselves worthy of you when in reality we are worthy of nothing but condemnation. These are the truths that we must understand before we can receive grace. Spirit of God, would you reveal these things in the hearts of people here who don't know that they don't know you. That would be a wonderful grace and cause great joy. Bless the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.